Therefore, it is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I was reading the Globe and Mail editorial, uh, and it, I'm going to share with you what that editorial said. According to the Premier's energy plan, she isn't fixing the electricity mess. Order. She isn't lowering the extortionate system costs created by a decade of poor choices and mismanagement of the province's power system. She's simply rigging consumers' bills during an election year. So, Mr. Speaker, my question for the Premier, this isn't about, this isn't about fixing the structural challenges. Is it just about what we all know it is, your own political survival? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. What our Fair Hydro Plan is about is taking a burden off people's electricity bills there all around are. the province, Mr. Speaker. It's about making sure that people see, on average, a 25 per cent reduction, Mr. Speaker. People who are having trouble paying their rent, who are uh, having trouble uh, looking after their families, Mr. Speaker, making sure that they have Order, the needs that they need soon, Mr. Speaker, that they have it, that it's practical, Mr. Speaker, and that it's adequate. That's what our Fair Hydro Plan is about, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier and again from this Globe and Mail editorial, they said this scheme is nothing more than, I quote, a Liberal Premier has found another way to make Ontario. Sorry. I tried just asking, and obviously uh, you've now maybe been trained that you have to wait for warnings. So I'm going to try to ask you one last time when I've got all of your attention. Let's just let the question be put and let's let the answer be put. If I have to, I will intervene again. Mr. Speaker, obviously this is a sensitive topic for the Liberal government. The Globe and Mail editorial said a Liberal Premier has found yet another way to make Ontarians pay more for electricity. But this one is selling it as an act of being a thoughtful government coming to the aid of families. And that is exactly why I have written the Financial Accountability Officer asking for an open and transparent and honest accounting of what this is going to cost Ontarians and if the government's numbers are actually accurate. Mr. Speaker, the truth will come out eventually. Just how much debt is going to be saddled on the next generation of Ontarians? Question. Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to say that the Office of the Financial Accountability Officer was briefed yes, on uh, uh, last week, Mr. Speaker. So we're, you know, we're very happy to have the uh, FAO get the information that he needs. His office has been briefed, and we will continue to work with him. Uh, and in fact, as the leader of the opposition knows, we actually expanded the purview of the uh, Financial Account Accountability Officer so that he That's could right. get all of the information that he we're wanted. So, so we're uh, we're happy to do that, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, this plan is about giving people relief on their electricity bills. It's about spreading out costs over a, a longer period of time, Mr. Speaker. Costs that have been incurred through investments in a system that was degraded, Mr. Speaker, that had to be upgraded, that was, um, you know, susceptible to brownouts and blackouts when we came into office under the previous uh, premier, Mr. Speaker. We absolutely had to make the investments. We've done that. We have a clean, reliable electricity grid. And we're Thank going to relieve people of their electricity costs. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, the Globe and Mail placed the blame where it belongs. I quote from the Globe and Mail, the blame for this falls squarely on consecutive Liberal governments of former Premier Dalton McGuinty and his successor, the Premier of Ontario today, in power since 2003. Their mismanagement of Ontario's power system has led today. That's their mismanagement. And now the Liberal government, to pay for their mistakes, for their mismanagement, it's going to cost $25 billion of additional interest costs. But, Mr. Speaker, we've seen the Liberal math before and how it doesn't add up and how it seems to be something different afterwards. Just look at the gas plant. The, it was supposed to cost a cup of coffee, and then it was, then it was $40 million, and then costs skyrocketed. Their numbers historically question. do not add up. So my question, Mr. Speaker, given the fact their math hasn't added up before, can we have the guarantee of the Premier they will not block any information being shared Thank with you. the Financial Accountability Officer? Speaker, we've already 
provided a technical briefing to the Office of the FAO. We are happy for the Financial Accountability Officer to have the information that is available to uh, to his office already. It's already there, Mr. Speaker. So we'll continue to work with him. But, Mr. Speaker, underlying the question of the uh, leader of the opposition is an assumption that had they had the opportunity, they would. The conversation between members on each side is going to stop. Finish, please. They would not have upgraded the system. They have, would not have cleaned the electricity grid, Mr. Speaker. And then they would not have had a plan. The member from Bruce Gray Owen costs, Sound. Mr. Speaker, we've taken the responsible path. We know that the costs that people are being asked to pay are too upfront. The member from Leeds Grenville. Spreading those over a longer period of time. 25% reduction on average, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. That's what we're moving yeah. forward with. New question. The leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Families and supporters of Grandview's Children's Centre rallied together on the weekend to fight for fair funding. Grandview has been waiting nine years. Nine years, Mr. Speaker. Minister nine Finance, years come to order. And shovels have sat idly by. Nine years, children with autism have been sitting on a wait list. These children and their families deserve better. Your own Liberal caucus members have written the Premier pleading for action, but the Premier's office has ignored her own caucus members. I asked about this, Mr. Speaker, on November 24th, and I was told by the government they were going to look into it. Here we are months later, and nothing has happened. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is directly to the Premier. Will the government commit to the proper funding for the new Grandview Centre? Yes or no? The, the community in Durham is tired of waiting. Question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I know that the Minister of Children and Youth Services is going to want to speak to the specifics, but I just want to be very clear that in no way have I or my office ignored the commentary from, quite frankly, all of the members from Durham, but certainly from, uh, from our own caucus, Mr. Speaker. I know that this is a very worthwhile project. It's something that needs to move ahead, Mr. Speaker, and it's something that I know the Minister of Children and Youth Services will be happy to give an update on. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier, the awesome. Speaker. Thank you. The Grandview situation is absolutely heartbreaking. Nine years of waiting. The land's been donated, eight million dollars raised, and sadly, Speaker, 2,753 children on the wait list. Mr. Speaker, how much longer must these children and families wait? Thank you. Thank you. Children Youth Services. Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for the question. Um, as soon as the legislature went into recess this past uh, winter, I uh, made my way out to Grandview. as It's one of my uh, my priorities uh, in regards to visits. And I just want to say uh, the center is a remarkable place. Uh, I met with parents there. I met with staff, and um, to listen to their concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Speaker, we're a government that's invested in the last several years over $300 million into capital programs for our children treatment centers. We have a process in place, and I went out there to listen. And um, um, we're taking all of those. Uh, requests for capital uh, programs, Very and there's fine. a process in place, um, and uh, we'll be making a decision uh, shortly in regards to where we spend those capital dollars. So Very I'd fine. like to thank the member for his advocacy, but um, uh, we're paying attention on this side, and uh, we'll continue to work with uh, Grandview to make sure okay. we position it for success here in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Foreign Hill. Thank you. Back to the Premier. Families of Grandview kids across Durham Region have been waiting for approval of Grandview's project. In November 2015, the town of Ajax announced the donation of a five-acre parcel of land for the future new headquarters of Grandview. They are the only children's treatment centre in Durham Region providing specialized programs, outpatient clinical treatment and support to thousands of children and youth with special needs and their families. They also offer ABA therapy for children with autism. Yet over 2,700 children sit on a wait list while this government yep. fails to act. Mr. Speaker, I toured Grandview just last Friday and I can say with certainty the time to act is now. Will the Liberals announce the funding of the new Grandview Centre today? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, um, I'd like to thank the member for the question. Uh, she brought up uh, funding for autism as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a point in her question. Um, the member knows that um, our autism funding is uh, historically the largest investment in autism in the history of this province, if not the entire country. 
And uh, so we're making we're making inroads. We've got challenges in the system, and Mr. Speaker, when it comes to mental health, when it comes to autism, when it comes to our children. But we're doing everything we can to make sure we position them for success. Grandview is an exceptional place, doing great work. Um, you know, in our child treatment centres across the province, over 76,000 young people are treated each year, and we're proud of that. And we know we need to build more capacity within the system, and that's why we keep investing into uh, capital programs and rebuilds for our treatment centres here in Ontario. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. The Premier and the Liberals have had 14 years to fix the mess that her party has helped create in our hydro system. But it is only the last few weeks that she's admitted that there is a problem, Speaker, and only last week she admitted she could actually do something about it. Up until she began to fear for her political life, she told Ontarians there either was no problem or, if there was, there was nothing she could do about it. The Premier told this House, and I quote, our rates are competitive with New York, with Michigan, with Pennsylvania. Those energy prices are competitive, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. I asked the Premier, what's behind the sudden conversion? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, first of all, that's just not an accurate portrayal of uh, the situation. The fact is that for, for some time, a number of years, Mr. Speaker, we've been working to take costs out of the system. We renegotiated the Samsung deal, Mr. Speaker. We made a decision about uh, not building new nuclear. We were very aware, Mr. Speaker, that we needed to find ways to get costs out of the electricity system. Um, we made a decision around the 8% uh, reduction uh, on electricity bills, the provincial portion of the HST, last year. Mr. Speaker, it's in effect now, and we and Member we from did Bruce hear Graham from people Second around time. the province, and I knew that it was not enough. That's why we brought forward an average 25 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker, that people will see on their bills this summer. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, hydro rates have been a crisis for families and businesses in Ontario for as long as the premier has been saying there was no crisis, and it's not just the premier. That denied the problem. Speaker, on September 15, 2016, the minister said, quote, energy costs are in the middle of the pack when compared to other Canadian provinces. The government has used virtually all available public policy levers at our disposal to mitigate rate pressures for customers. When will the Premier admit how out of touch she is with Ontarians and apologize for denying over and over again that the crisis they were facing is real? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Speaker, it seems to me that a policy a plan that has been brought forward that is actually going to reduce people's electricity bills in a number of ways. First of all, an uh, across-the-board average 25 percent cut for residents who pay uh, bills, Mr. Speaker, they're going to see, on average, a 25 percent cut. People who pay exorbitant distribution rates, Mr. Speaker, uh, in rural and remote communities, Absolutely. they're going to see Absolutely. another 10 or 15 percent reduction, yeah, Mr. Fantastic. Speaker. People who are living on low incomes, they're going to see an enhanced benefit so they will see further cuts. Mr. Speaker, that's a practical plan that I think demonstrates that we have understood. We've listened, we've understood, we've brought forward a practical plan as opposed to, Mr. Speaker, a plan that does not respond because it would not work, which is what the NDP has brought forward. We've brought forward a plan that actually is practical and is going to reduce Answer. people's electricity bills. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, she may forget this, but the other part of the Premier's story was that the Liberal government had no control over hydro prices, that it was all in the hands of the Ontario Energy Board. On September 29, 2016, the Minister of Energy said, quote, the OEB is a quasi-judicial organization that's not part of the government. They set the rates. Uh. Clearly, the Premier does think she has control over rates because just last week, she finally decided that the political cost to her and her party of ignoring this crisis that she has created for Ontario families was just too much, and she came up with a Band-Aid fix. What changed, Speaker? Mr. Speaker, for many months, many months, Mr. Speaker, we have been working on finding a solution to help people with their electricity bills. Whether the leader of the third 
party accepts that or not, Mr. Speaker, is entirely beside the point. Vote the point the is that there are people in this province who are paying too much for their electricity, Mr. Speaker. They can't afford to look after themselves, their families. There are people in this province who are paying too high distribution costs, Mr. Speaker, and there are people living on low income who are not getting enough support. We are tackling all of those challenges, Mr. Speaker. The relief will be in place in the summer. It will stay in place, Mr. Speaker. And you know, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that I am most interested in those people, in their concerns and their families, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. You know, one part of the uh, of the Premier's story that she still clings to is that selling Hydro One is a good idea. Once again, ignoring the wishes of the vast majority of Ontarians. By returning Hydro One to public hands, we bring in seven billion dollars. We bring in seven billion dollars over the next 30 years that we can invest in Ontario. Instead of investing in Ontario families and businesses, the Liberal plan gives away an additional 25 to 40 billion dollars over that same period to bankers. Speaker, when will this premier wake up and realize that continuing with her wrong-headed self? Off of Hydro One is not just unpopular, Question. vastly unpopular, Speaker. It is absolutely the wrong thing to do for Ontario. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, just again, we put the facts on the table. The, uh, the proposal that the leader of the third party has brought forward is part of her plan that would not work. Uh, part of that plan is to, uh, is to stop the uh, broadening of the ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, and buy back Hydro One, none of which would take one cent off one electricity bill in this province, Mr. Speaker, not a penny. So what we brought forward is a plan that will reduce people's electricity bills, Mr. Speaker, will spread the costs over a 30-year period for an asset and for assets that are going to be used by people for that period, Mr. Speaker. So it's only right, it's only fair that people in this generation would pay part of the cost, but people who are going to be using that asset down the road, that they would pay part of the, uh, the freight for that, Mr. Speaker. That's what we're doing. We're bringing forward relief for people immediately. Thank Mr. you. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, the Liberal plan will cost the people of Ontario more in the long run. That's that right. is absolutely the case. And it doesn't solve any, not a single one of the underlying problems in our current electricity system, nor does it stop the sell-off of Hydro One. For years, the Premier didn't listen to Ontarians when they were struggling with hydro bills that were far too high and that they could no longer afford. The Premier has not learned learned from that lesson, Speaker. Why isn't she listening to Ontarians who are telling her that the right thing to do is stop putting her political career ahead of the people of this province and put an end, once and for all, to her wrong-headed decision to sell off Hydro One, their vital public asset? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker. It's actually hard to know where to begin. Um, the, rea the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that underlying the, the question from the leader of the third party is an assumption that there was no need to rebuild the electricity system in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We don't need a clean electricity grid. We don't need to build all those thousands of kilometers of line, Mr. Speaker. We don't need clean renewable capacity. We don't need, because underlying her question about, the, uh, about Hydro One is, we don't need to build transit, all of which, Mr. Speaker, I think are really surprising assertions coming from the NDP. And on top of that, Mr. Speaker, the proposal that she has put forward to reduce electricity costs because of the investments that we've made, Mr. Speaker, there is a cost associated with those. The proposal she's brought forward would not work, Answer. would not take money off people's electricity bills. We've brought forward a practical plan that will reduce people's electricity Thank bills, you. and that's the right thing to do, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, what we don't need is to sell off a vital public asset that generates revenues for the people of Ontario. That's what we don't need. 
People need more speaker than a desperate attempt to hold on to political power. People need that so much, need so much more than that speaker. People need more than a plan that kicks the problems in our hydro system down to our grandkids. Speaker, we need a plan that prioritizes Ontario families and businesses because all Ontarians see that the Liberal plan is an extra 40 billion dollars going into the pockets of this Premier's banker friends. When will this Premier show Ontarians that she is about more than saving her own political skin, admit that she was wrong, and stop the sell-off of Hydro Question. One? Thank you. Here. Speaker, you know, um, I've been asked, I've been asked a lot about this question of uh, of grandchildren and uh, how would we explain to our grandchildren? Well, I have three grandchildren, and I'm quite comfortable, Mr. Speaker, talking to Olivia and Claire and Hugh about the reality that their mom and dad need some support in order to be able to, you know, allow them to take skating lessons or swimming lessons, Mr. Speaker, allowing them to do the things that they want to do for their family now, and that will mean that Libby and Claire and Hugh, when they're using those same assets, they'll be helping to pay for Finish, please. That Libby and Claire and Hugh will be helping to pay for those assets. Mr. Speaker, for months, the leader of the third party has been looking for solutions to actually help people in their, uh, in their daily lives. Answer. We're bringing that forward, Mr. Speaker. I would have thought she might have been supportive. Thank you. No question. The member from Nipissing. Yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, come to order. Start the clock. <laughs> New question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, rumours have surfaced regarding the employment status of the 70 men and women at the OPG facility in North Bay. In fact, these now appear to be more than rumours. OPG has refused to answer any questions from the municipality regarding the future in North Bay. Relations come to order. OPG and North Bay have had more than a 100-year relationship. They have a responsibility to be open and transparent with the communities they've had partnerships with, especially those for more than a century. If OPG is indeed transferring dozens of employees out of North Bay, why are they doing it by stealth? Speaker, I ask the Premier, does she agree this is an outrageous failure by a publicly owned corporation to live up to the standards of accountability that is expected here in Ontario? Thank you. Development and growth. Of economic development and trade. Well, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to respond on behalf of the, the Minister of, uh, of Energy. And uh, you know, it, it's, it, I find it kind of passing strange that the uh, the member opposite, who's always on his feet talking about efficiencies in government and doing the right thing and allowing our, our crown corporations to do what they need to do to be able to keep their budgets in, in in order is now standing up because something happens to be happening in his writing that now now it's something that sh they shouldn't be doing my understanding mr speaker is that there are no jobs being lost in this move but that the senior vice president is in north bay today speaking in person to the employees that are affected I know that this is, a, this is a decision that OPG takes seriously. OPG has more than 9,000 employees in every corner of this province, Mr. Speaker. They're a big corporation. But the role of, go of our government, the role of any government, is not to interfere with these human resources and, sir, issues. Thank you. Supplementary. For weeks, OPG told the media, quote, we don't respond to rumors. And for weeks, the City of North Bay's requests have gone unanswered. Their failure to respond has caused great concern in North Bay. 
Their silence is a betrayal by OPG to behave as good corporate citizens, and their refusal to be honest tells us to no longer trust what OPG says. If OPG is willing to turn its back on the city it's been in for 100 years and ignore the pleas of the, of the municipality, what else will they ignore? Speaker, I ask the Premier, if OPG won't be open about their plans in North Bay, how can they be trusted to be accountable for what they say about Question. any of their projects? Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's all about accountability. It's about giving our Crown corporations the ability to manage what they're doing in the best possible way. The member's on his feet all the time talking about cutting costs, cutting salaries, and all of that stuff. The minute something happens in his riding, Mr. Speaker, he wants us to go the opposite direction. Mr. Speaker, the senior vice president is in North Bay today. It is a sensitive issue, Mr. Speaker, and it's a, it's a, it's a decision the OPG takes very seriously. They'll be, be, they'll be working very closely with the labour union representatives, as they have been all along, and they'll work hard to balance providing thousands of good jobs in Ontario while delivering low-cost energy. That's, that's what we're trying to deliver here in Ontario. So you can't have it both ways, Mr. Mr. Speaker. can't have it both ways. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, question to the Premier. Over the weekend, there was a credible report that Hydro One is negotiating to purchase Toronto Hydro. There were denials, but we've heard many denials before, just like before the last election when the Premier denied that she was selling Hydro One. This sort of deal-making is happening because this government is giving out fat tax breaks to utilities that are sold to the private sector. Why is the Premier subsidizing the, privatiz sorry, the privatization of public utilities like Toronto Hydro? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. Speaker, as the mayor said on the weekend, uh, there's no discussions going on between our government and the city of Toronto on this matter. Uh, I don't know where the rumors came from, but you're asking me to respond to rumors uh, that uh, we, we don't. We have no idea what the source of those rumors are from. I think, though, Mr. Speaker, I mean, the, the, the question that Ontarians want to ask is: Are we getting value for the investments that we're making in our energy system? Are we getting value from from the tough decisions that this government's made in terms of uh, the Hydro One issue? And, Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is, the NDP now have a plan that they want to buy back for four billion dollars the, the the shares of Hydro One. Where are you going to get the money to pay for the interest? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. That was an odd one. Minister, finish. Finished. Well, Mr. Speaker, the question. Oh, okay. One sentence. <laughs> One sentence. That was it. <laughs> Where are they going to get the money to pay for the public transit that we're building in Toronto and across the province? Thank you. Province? <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, back to the Premier. I remember Ed Clark's words from October of 2015 when he said Hydro One transmission should stay in public hands. Yeah. The Liberal yeah. government announced six months later they were selling off Hydro One. Shame. The Premier has given the public good reason to be cynical and skeptical when it comes to privatization and Ontario's electricity system. Will the Premier stop subsidizing the sale of public utilities to private investors. Thank you, Mr. Minister. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, that question's more about arcane, uh, outdated political philosophy than it is about running an efficient hydro system. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, the issue that he's referring to, and I, I'll say it again, there are no discussions going on between the province and the city of Toronto about Toronto Hydro. So, so let's be very, very clear about that. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we have to find ways to build public transit across this province. We have to find ways to build more roads and bridges across this province. The NDP want to go back to the days where we had a huge deficit in infrastructure. We're not going to do that. 
that, Mr. Speaker. We've made tough decisions on this side of the House because we know how important it is to the people of, the, of, the, of Toronto, the people of Ontario, to build transit, to build roads, to build Answer. bridges, to build this province up and to make this economy hum, Mr. Speaker. That's what we've, we've mandated ourselves to do, Thank and you. that's what we're going to do. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, last week, the government took a momentous step forward in ensuring that clean, reliable energy is affordable for everyone in Ontario. That announcement, the Fair Hydro Plan, is a 25 per cent reduction on average for all households in Ontario. No loopholes, no exceptions, just significant relief for this very important household cost. I know that this announcement is going to go a long way in helping families in my riding of Kitchener Centre and right across the province of Ontario. Of course, homeowners are not the only ones in the province who are paying electricity bills. Business owners have also said that they face challenges with their monthly electricity costs. Speaker, would the minister please share with this House in what ways the government's fair hydro plan is going to help businesses in the province of Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Economic Development and Trade. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Ensuring electricity is affordable for business is a very important part of maintaining Ontario's strong economy. Last, last year, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce launched a campaign called Small Business Too Big to Ignore. It highlighted the importance of small business to Ontario's economy and some of the challenges they face. Electricity prices were one of those challenges. I'm pleased to share that the Fair Hydro Plan for Ontario is designed to help on exactly this issue. The 25 per cent reduction applies not only to every household in this province, but to tens of thousands of small businesses as well. Everyone who pays time of use prices will see this benefit regardless of whether they're a home, a farm, or a small, bi or a small business. There is no doubt that 25 per cent is a significant savings and will sir. go a long way to ensuring that the cost of doing business in this important sector, Mr. Speaker, is still very competitive in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for his answer. These reductions in energy bills are getting very positive reaction from Ontarians. All residential electricity customers, farms and small businesses are going to be seeing an average of 25 per cent off their bills. This is the largest electricity price cut in Ontario's history. Low-income customers and those living in rural areas with the highest delivery charges are going to see even further reductions. Now, In my riding of Kitchener Centre this past weekend, constituents that I ran into at public events and, and even at the grocery store came up to me to tell me that they welcome the actions that our government is taking. Speaker, I'd like to ask the minister how these initiatives are going to impact the economy here in the province of Ontario. Good question. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government announced a bold but sensible plan to lower electricity rates for households and businesses. All businesses, all businesses will see a 2 to 4% reduction in their energy costs. Many small businesses will see a 25 per cent reduction. Those medium-sized manufacturing and food processing companies that now qualify, will now qualify for the Industrial Conservation Initiative, and that could save them up to about a third of their energy bill. It's important to point out, though, Mr. Speaker, the reason why we are able to afford to do this is that the Ontario economy is doing very well. We're leading the country in job creation. We're leading the entire G7 in growth. We've now created 700 net new jobs since the recession. Our unemployment rate is at an eight-year low. This economic growth has enabled us to make these important investments to lower energy bills. Answer. Speaker, we now have an energy system in the province that is not only clean and reliable, but also affordable. Thank new, you, Mr. New Speaker. Question, the member from Ladder, from Net and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, a few weeks ago, Northland Power's Kingston Generating Station was forced to close its doors along with 18 jobs. For 20 years, Northland was under contract to the IESO, and their contract had ended on January 1st. They offered a new contract to sell their power at a the very low rate of 5.9 cents per kilowatt hour for another five years. But this government would not purchase this clean, cheap power, and they won't allow Northland to sell directly to other consumers. Just down the road in Bath, they're building a new generating station 
that's been contracted to sell power at 20 cents per kilowatt hour. What? And just across the water on Amherst Island, they're building wind turbines that they're contracted at over 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Question. Speaker, why does the Premier insist on shutting down clean, low-cost electrical generating stations and make Ontario consumers buy the most expensive electric? Thank you. Mr. Of Economic Development and Growth. Of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Ironically, this the particular contract the member is talking about was signed during the Conservative government. You know what, Mr. Speaker? What that contract did is it meant that generators did run around the clock, creating excess uh, greenhouse gas emissions and operating at uncompetitive prices. Under the updated contracts, these facilities will only choose to produce power when they can compete with other forms of generation in Ontario's electricity market. The replacement contracts will result in ratepayer savings, savings of up to $53 million. Mr. Speaker, they laugh at savings, but Mr. Speaker, that's how we're able to continue to drive down energy rates in this in this province. Answer. So we're going to keep working at bringing savings in the energy system, even if the PC. Thank you. The member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. The member from Renfrew, second time. I'm just keeping my memory of who was heckling. Supplement. Again to the Premier. But I will say, uh, Speaker, that that response was nothing but poppycock from, uh, from the minister. This premier has stated she has made mistakes, and that's clearly an understatement. But this latest screw-up demonstrates that the premier continues to make the same mistakes and has not learned any lessons. The premier continues to build expensive, unneeded generating stations while she closes down low-cost existing generating stations. The premier throws people out of work while increasing the cost of electricity and adds billions to our debt. Speaker, Ontario is becoming an energy wasteland under this government. Mothball generating stations, energy poverty, 600,000 consumers who can't pay their monthly bills, and the premier's solution is to turn Ontario into a subprime debtor with multiple subprime low mortgages. Speaker, will the premier commit to ending these generating plants, not only in Bath and Amherst Island, but everywhere Question. in this province? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's funny. There was a time when the uh, PCs used to talk about trying to cut energy costs. Today, they're asking question after question about ways to increase costs within the energy system. We're not going to apologize, Mr. Speaker, for finding savings in our energy system. That's how we're able to lower energy rates to the people of this province. A 25 per cent cut in energy rates for every household in this province because, Mr. Speaker, we're doing what we need to do to make our energy system as efficient as we possibly can. Mr. Speaker, there's still a lot of work to do. We're in the process of replacing 80 per cent of the infrastructure in our energy system. We're well on the way to doing it. We've had to expend about $50 billion, Mr. Speaker, for the last 10 years to do that. Mr. I know the member wants to listen instead of heckle while he's hearing the answer. I know. Order. New question. The member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. A few weeks ago, Metrolinx provided an update to its fare integration process. Metrolinx is now looking at basing transit fares in the GTA on fare by distance, like a private taxi company. It's becoming clear that the government's fare integration process is not about transit service, ridership, or the public good. This is about imposing more costs onto riders, Minister especially TTC riders living in places like Scarborough, North York, and Etobicoke. Instead of imposing more costs onto riders, will the Premier restore provincial funding for municipal transit operations as the City of Toronto and the NDP whip. has proposed? Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for the question. I think that member knows that, in fact, what Metrolinx has done is put forward uh, four separate uh, concepts or ideas 
uh, for the fair, uh, the fair integration discussion. I should note, Speaker, that in 2014, the mandate letter that I received from the Premier stipulated that moving forward with delivering on fair integration is a critical part of the Ministry of Transportation's mandate. And of course, Speaker, that member, I think all members from the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area uh, would know, Speaker, that in fact providing that notion of integrating the fare system, uh, which is uh, set uh, with respect to the table being set by the Presto fare card fully deployed uh, right across the, the Greater Toronto shot. Hamilton area, Speaker, uh, that we are moving towards that fare integration concept. But to the member's question, that is simply one of four concepts that is being uh, that is being consulted upon. We look forward. Metrolinx looks forward to getting back uh, with respect to the feedback, and we'll have an update in the coming months. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Speaker. This question is again back to the Premier. Uh, because Metrolinx's fare integration uh, process keeps getting more complicated and more convoluted. The minister will know that. Taxi-style transit fares are about helping the government cut costs by imposing those costs onto the riders who rely on transit most. Riders don't want complicated fares where they need a calculator, a ruler, and a map to figure out how much it's going to cost to get to work. They want a simple and affordable fare that lets them travel across the region. Will the Premier guarantee to put riders and the public interest first and restore funding for municipal transit operations as the NDP has proposed? Or not? Yes or no? Uh, speaker, thanks very much. I thank the member for the follow-up. I, I mean, I can say very clearly in this House that making sure that we take into account the affordability and accessibility concerns of tran transit users across the region is uh, very, very much top of mind for Metrolinx and for, for our team at MTO, and we'll continue to keep that top of mind. But, Speaker, really and truly, that member should know, a number of weeks ago, the Premier announced that over the next four years, our government will be doubling the gas tax money wow. that the City of Toronto, that all 905 communities, wow. and frankly, Speaker, nearly 100 communities across the province of Ontario that have transit that. systems will be receiving. That means, Speaker, that by 2021, the City of Toronto will be receiving approximately $340 million from this wow. government to support the expansion of transit, Speaker. Wow. Interestingly, the leader of the NDP's plan to provide transit funding support for Toronto Answer. does nothing for the 98 other communities across the province, like Ottawa, like Waterloo, like Vaughan, Speaker, that have transit systems and need our help as well. Thank you. New question. The member from Ottawa, Vanier. Mr. President, my question, uh, speaker, my question is for Municipal Affairs. Jim Watson, Ottawa Mayor is in Queen's Park with a delegation of uh, high technology companies in Ottawa. As a mayor and also as a former Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, today is speaking with the Premier about local priorities in Ottawa. And I know that this is part of an ongoing conversations that our government has with municipalities, including the AMO Roundtable and several annual conferences like Roma and OGRA, to which I had the occasion to participate. Local governments play an important role in our communities, in our day-to-day -day lives, and I want to salute all the workers around the province who make our communities work better for us, and particularly the workers of Ottawa Valley. Question. Can the Minister of Municipal Affairs elaborate on how, as a province, we support local priorities and municipal governments? Speaker, thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, the member very much for the question, and I know the Minister of Economic Development and Growth is, is going to want to weigh in on the second half of this. I do want to give a shout-out to the Mayor of Ottawa, Jim Watson, who, Speaker, previously was here in this capacity, my capacity that I now have as the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Jim was responsible, in a large part, for the upload agreement that is now in effect in the province of Ontario that resulted in the province taking significant financial pressure off of the backs of municipalities. And Speaker, I think it bears repeating that when we talk about uploads in our ministry and from our government, that people at the residential property tax base level really understands what this has meant for them over the course of the last 10 or 12 years. We now transfer $4 billion in total financial assistance to all 444 municipalities in the province of Ontario in some way, shape or form. That, Speaker, is yes, up to $1.1 billion in 2000. 
2003. Wow. Fully $3 billion more is now being transferred to municipalities to Thank provide you. relief for them at the municipal property tax level. Supplementary, the member from Ottawa South. I'd like to thank the minister for his answer, and I was uh, uh, as well pleased to join with my colleagues this morning as we met with a large delegation of community leaders from Ottawa, led by Mayor Watson and Sir Terry Matthews. So this morning we learned about the groundbreaking work that's being done in 5G networks and autonomous cars in our community. We learned, or some of us already knew, that Ottawa is home to the largest technology park in all of Canada, some 30,000 employees and 500 companies. So we also learned very interestingly about the collaborative effort of companies working together to make sure they could stimulate innovation and compete in the world as a region. So, Speaker, I know the delegation, or Speaker, I know the delegation is being with many ministers today. So, I just like to ask the minister if he could speak to our commitment to investing in Ottawa's uh, technology sector. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Minister, Minister Affairs. The Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for Ottawa South for that question. I, I think he had trouble containing his enthusiasm, and, and I don't blame him. When I hear from my colleague next to me here, the Minister of Infrastructure, and they tell us about the exciting things happening in Ottawa, I think we can declare today that Ottawa's, there's a renaissance going on in Ottawa's tech community that we haven't seen since the high days of Nortel. And it's so, so exciting, Mr. Speaker. I'm looking forward to meeting with Mayor Watson as well and his very impressive delegation. But I can tell you that Ottawa is fast becoming a leading global innovation hub for exciting disruptive technologies like 5G and, and, and new generation networks, as well as connected and autonomous cars. And they're a, they already are a global leader, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to cybersecurity. Answer. Companies like QNX are just knocking the socks off the rest of the world, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to connected cars and autonomous cars. That region is alive, Thank healthy, you. and experiencing a renaissance. A new question from Renfrew, Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The Grove is a 60-bed nursing home in Ironprior, servicing approximately 30,000 residents. Its licenses expire in 2025. It must redevelop but it is not feasible with only 60 beds, 60 bed licenses. Without additional licenses, the Grove will close, leaving an area with already half the provincial average of beds per 1,000 with no beds at all. On top of that, from May 2015 to May 2016, the Grove saw a 30 per cent increase in its wait list. The problem is getting worse, not better. Speaker, the situation is becoming critical. The good news is that Iron Prior Regional Health has a redevelopment plan to address this chronic shortage. What they are asking for is for the minister to personally meet with them to discuss their redevelopment plan. Question. Will the minister agree to take the meeting? Good. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank you. Uh Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from the member opposite. Who has, we've actually spoken a number of times uh, about this issue with regards to Grove Arm Prior and District Nursing Home, affectionately known as the Grove. Uh, he's been a strong advocate for the redevelopment that they are uh, both eligible for and in the process of undertaking, Mr. Speaker. So uh, it's important to recognize that. Uh, this is part of a larger redevelopment of 30,000 uh, long-term care beds across the province to bring more than 300 homes up to code so the design standards are uh, appropriate for this day and age. But with regards to Grove, uh, I have to uh, say, Mr. Speaker, that my office has been deeply involved, not just the ministry, both in capital as well as in the long-term care division, but my office uh, specifically uh, has held uh, yes, two meetings, uh, had a number of uh, phone calls uh, with the president and CEO of Grove. We believe we're working collaboratively. We want that collaboration uh, to continue. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. I have well over 1,000 individually signed postcards calling on the Minister to act. I will send these down with a page. Minister, the community sees this as a highest priority project. To be fair, your ministry has been working with Iron Prior Regional Health, but no acceptable outcome has been achieved. With an aging population, longer life expectancies, and an explosion in rates of dementia and Alzheimer's, the minister knows that the status quo will not do. A solution must be found. 
for the good of the seniors, our seniors, and the people of Iron Fire, we need the minister to step up. Speaker, once again, and I hope you'll answer the question directly, Minister, will you commit to question. personally meeting with the Iron Fire Regional Health and community leaders to discuss this most important redevelopment plan? Thank you. Please meet with the people. Minister. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. And I was actually looking for something that would help to, uh, to make it easier so I don't have to look down. I appreciate receiving from any member, Mr. Speaker. I uh, appreciate re receiving postcards and petitions and information that allows me to understand the level of com community support. There is no doubt when it comes to the growth that this is a, a, such a, a well-respected and loved uh, 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 home for so many of the seniors uh, in that part of our province, uh, Mr. Speaker. So as I mentioned, we are, and I believe that Eric Hanna, who's the president and CEO of Arm Prior Regional Health, which is the operator of the long-term care home, I believe that he would agree with me in saying that we are working very closely, extremely collaboratively as well. As I referenced, my office is directly involved through meetings, through phone calls, the ministry, through two divisions uh, within the ministry as well. And of course, if it's necessary to have additional meetings yes, with myself in order to, uh, to uh, reach the accommodation I think that we all share in terms of this redevelopment, I'm prepared to do that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On Saturday, I met with Mayor Ted Hicks of Deborah. Mayor Hicks told me that he fears having to close his community's arena due to hydro bills so out of control that they now account for 40 per cent of his operating costs. Whoa. The next generation will lose out if the Deborah rink collapses under the weight of the Liberal government's out-of-control hydro bills. Why won't the Premier prioritize places like Deborah Arena and the families that use it instead of coming up with a plan that puts $40 billion in the pockets of a few of her well-connected banker friends. Thank you, Mr. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. Speaker, last week we put out a plan that's going to save every household in, the, in this province 25 per cent off their energy bills, as well as small businesses, as well as farms. Mr. Speaker, we're very proud of that plan. Also, about a week ago, the NDP came out with something they called a plan that people dissed as something that wasn't even close to sensible or a plan at all. In fact, Mr. Speaker, their plan relied on only federal generosity and future expert panels with nothing concrete at all as to how they would actually reduce energy costs, with nothing concrete at all, Mr. Speaker, as to, as to how they would bring down uh, energy prices. So, Mr. Speaker, our plan has substance. Our plan is bold. Our plan reduces yes, energy rates by 25 per cent across this province, and we're very, very proud of that plan. Thank Mr. you. Speaker. Supplementary. I don't think I've ever heard anything more ridiculous in this House, Speaker. But nonetheless, it isn't just the Mayor of Deborah, Speaker, who's worried for his community half. I met with leaders and mayors from Echo Bay, Bruce Mines, Hilton Beach, St. Joseph, and Batchewana First Nation, and all of them told me how families and community spaces in their towns are struggling to keep up with astronomically high hydro bills. Why doesn't this Premier understand that these leaders need more from her than a plan that puts $40 billion into the pockets of bankers on Bay Street and ignores real long-term solutions that could help people now and make sure that the next generation isn't thrown right back into this mess? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, when you look at our record of supporting our municipalities, it is unprecedented, Mr. Speaker. When you look at the infrastructure investments that we've made with our municipalities in some of those areas that the member's talking about, unprecedented, Mr. Speaker. We're investing $160 billion in infrastructure over the next 12 years. That's a significant impact on our municipalities and all the services that they provide, Mr. Speaker. We've uploaded billions of dollars from the municipal tax uh, rolls, Mr. Speaker, to help our municipalities thrive and benefit, Mr. Speaker. So when the member says, says that we're not helping municipalities, she is dead wrong, Mr. Speaker. We're there for municipalities. We'll always be there for municipalities, and we'll Answer. continue to be in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. 2016 was an exciting year for transit in Barrie. In August, I welcomed the Premier and the Prime Minister to my community to announce the new public 
Transportation Infrastructure Fund. This joint funding from our government and the federal government is helping Barrie expand its bus fleet and provide better service in our community. In December, the Minister of Transportation joined me for another exciting announcement new weekend and holiday go service to Barrie. Wow, but, Speaker, it. I know that there's more that we can do to make sure Barrie's transit network is meeting the needs of our community for today and for tomorrow. Will the minister please provide an update on what else the government is doing to support transit in my community of Barrie? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Question. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Of course, I want to begin by saying uh, to this House, to everybody watching at home, that the member from Barrie is such an extraordinary champion for her community, Speaker. Uh, she has literally held my feet to the fire, uh, Speaker, to make sure that not just this year, but for the next 10 years and beyond, Speaker, we continue to make critical investments in the transit that that fast-growing community needs. Speaker, I applaud that member for being an outstanding champion. She's 100 percent right. Whether we're talking about extending a weekend and holiday service year-round on the Barry Go Line, Speaker, whether we're talking about critical highway and uh, in infrastructure projects around the widening of Highway 400, Speaker, uh, or, Speaker, whether we're talking about what I referenced just a few minutes ago in this House, the fact that over the next four years, because of Premier Wynne's leadership, we are going to be doubling the gas tax money specifically for Barrie, Speaker. That means that by 2021-2022, Speaker, Barrie can expect to receive Answer. approximately $4 million, Speaker. $4 million, buy more buses, providing more service for more families and more neighborhoods, Speaker. Thank you. Thanks to our Premier and the member from Barrie for her championing her community. Thanks. Thank you. thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for that answer. When I talk to members of my community, one thing that always comes across loud and clear What's is that, that they're looking for improved transit options. Right. I recently heard from a community member who is a single parent without a car. Each and every day, they depend on Barry Transit to move between work, their child's school, and the grocery store, and eventually back home. That's stressful, even if you do have a car. That's right. But I know this story isn't unique and that any improvement that makes these daily tasks easier for members in my community is a worthwhile investment. Right. Mr. Speaker, will the minister please explain how the new gas tax funding will improve transit in Barrie and other communities across this province? Thank you, Minister. Well, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. Again, I thank that member for her follow-up question. Speaker, I think everybody here knows that when our government uh, collects gas tax monies from across the province. We currently allocate two cents of what we collect out to municipalities. Over the next four years, Speaker, that two cents will move up to four cents wow, incrementally, Speaker. But here's the best news for people in Barrie and right across Ontario. That additional four cents of the gas tax that we're allocating to Barrie and the 98 other communities that have transit systems will not place any additional burden on people in this province, Speaker. We are not increasing the gas tax. We are simply showing the leadership to support transit by allocating more of the money that we already collect, Speaker. In Barrie, again, that means more buses potentially, providing more transit service to more families in more neighborhoods, which is exceedingly exciting for that member, for her community, for her mayor, Speaker, and for so many others. And I would certainly and hope sir? that members in both the Conservative Caucus and the NDP Caucus would understand that this is an enlightened approach, Speaker, to expanding transit every corner of Ontario. Thank you. New question, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The current government has been in power since the Ring of Fire was first discovered. Yep. At various points in the past five years, this government has been quick to try to take credit, but to date we are still waiting for a mine to open in the region. What? Noront is ready to get a nickel mine up and running with an eye to future expansion. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce estimates that 5,500 jobs will be created if the project is brought into production. Speaker, I've asked this question repeatedly over the past three years. Will this government finally take a leadership role that will make the Ring of Fire a reality in Ontario? Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for the question, and I understand uh, why the member would ask it today. Uh, the PDAC conference is currently on here in Toronto, and I want to give a big shout out before I respond to the member. We had a great Ontario reception last night down at Steam Whistle, a great event. And I would say, and the reason I referenced that, Speaker, is when I was there, I had an opportunity to speak with Norant. And while I would not necessarily characterize their position right now, 
uh, what would be the language best to describe it? I would say they're optimistic, Speaker. I had, I'd say, at least 15 minutes uh, with the principal from Noron last night. There's more that I can add in the supplementary, Speaker, but they do see a path forward. I had a great opportunity to spend some time talking to the principal from Noron last night. We're very happy uh, with where this is at right now. We understand there's more work Sir. to be done, Speaker. We're committed to it. You, they know we've got a billion dollars on the table. We're committed to the work, and I look forward to working further on this file in Thank the weeks you. and months ahead. Supplementary. Again, to the Premier. Speaker, the minister continues to insist that progress is being made. Unfortunately, we are still waiting for evidence of those claims. When is someone over there going to make some decisions to move things forward? The known deposits in the region could sustain producing mines in the region for over 100 years. In the mandate letter to the minister from this past September, road work to upgrade existing infrastructure and connect the Ring of Fire is to commence. Speaker, does the Premier plan to meet this important target or simply continue to make promises until after the 2018 election? Yeah. Minister. You know, Speaker, yes, in fact, progress is being made. Now, if the member opposite and the parties opposite want to speak about progress in mining in the province of Ontario in the context of only one project, well, then that will be what they can do. What we can do on this side of the House, Speaker, is talk about the fact that currently, right now, in Ontario, there are three other mines under construction in the province, but they want to spend their time focusing on one. There's one not too far from my home community of Thunder Bay called the New Gold Project. Speaker, right now, under construction, 600 people working on a construction site, and when that mine is open for the next 10, 20, or 30 years of its life, there's going to be 450 people working in that mine. And that is not the only mine that is under construction right now in the province of Ontario. Mineral exploration activity in the province of Ontario is climbing after two down years. Global demand is coming back up. The price is coming back yes, up. Sir. Exploration activity in Ontario is going up. There's good news on the front, but they just want to focus on one particular project. Even before a vote, it's never too late to be asked to leave. The member from Leeds Grenville on a point of order. Point of order, Speaker. I'd like to uh, introduce and acknowledge uh, the birthday of a very special staff person in our legislative affairs team, Cody Welton. Happy birthday. Hey! From Beaches East York on a point of order. Yeah, thanks, Speaker. Point of order, my apologies. I just recognize a constituent in the public gallery. Uh, Stephen Crombie, welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. The Minister, of, uh, the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Just want to correct my record. I was told I said that we've created 700 jobs uh, since, the since the recession. It's 700,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 92, an act to amend the School Board's Collective Bargaining Act 2014 and make related amendments to other statutes. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? On February 23, 2017, Ms. Hunter moved second reading of Bill 92, an act to amend the School Bus Collective Bargaining Act 2014 and make re related amendments to other statutes. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Madame de Rosier. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mrs. Domerlin. Mrs. Domerlin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Hogarth. Mr. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Renil. Mr. Renil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cohn. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sal Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sal Muskoka. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Oh. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Shibby Song. Shibby Song. Mr. Vantov. Mr. Vantov. Ms. Denova. Ms. Denova. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jellin. Madame Jellin. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 74, the nays are 17. <laughs> the ayes being 74 and the nays being 17, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture du projet de loi. Pursuant to the order of the House dated March 2, 2017, the bill is now referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.